Hello and welcome to Autumn Wildlife. It's a wonderful thing to live in this country and have seasons. I love the change of the seasons, whatever season it is, it's fabulous. This morning when I was driving in, the most wonderful colours on the roadside trees and the occasional bright leaf drifting down in the sunlight and it was so beautiful. All sorts of colours in the woodlands at this time of year, mostly the yellows and golds that are so typical of this country. Now, this is the trees getting ready to lose their leaves for winter. Obviously, all deciduous trees drop their leaves and you might wonder why. Well, having a load of leaves in the winter isn't very useful for a tree because the light levels are so low it can't produce an awful lot of food from them and having a heavy burden of leaves means that you're in danger of wind blow if there are high gales or if there's a lot of snow it can break the branches if you've got a lot of weight of leaves on it's not going to help you also you're losing water through the leaves um, which you want to conserve and take away from your woody tissues so they're in less danger of freezing and breaking. So that's the why. Now, you might want to know how. Those of you who are scientifically minded, and I'm sure there's a few of you out there, how do they know when to do it? Trees have molecules in them called phytochromes, and these detect red light. At the point of the year that the light levels are dropping, the red light drops quickest. And when the tree sees through its phytochromes that the light is getting inadequate, the phytochromes switch off, which is a signal to the tree that it hardens the tissues and it produces abscisic acid, which means that the tree's leaves then get ready to drop. The colour changes, so the chlorophyll degrades and the golden yellows are what is in the left behind, if you like, and it was masked by the chlorophyll that makes the leaves green during the summer. So the leaf becomes yellow, gold, brown. Quite a lot of the um, imported trees if you the non-native trees, you get these wonderful red colours. And of course in the United States, people go on special trips to see the sugar maples and everything turning red in the autumn. Our native trees don't really have a lot of red colour in them. Um, the ones you see at the side of the road that are planted and they're turning red are usually maples. Um, the reason they go red is they actually produce a different chemical into the leaf at this time of year and you think that was an awful lot of effort to something that's just going to drop off but the red pigments which are called anthocyanins I told you it was for just scientific minded of you um, you don't need to know that it's just the red bits uh, act as a sunscreen and um, also an antifreeze so if it's cold and bright very, while the tree still has its leaves on. They're protected by the red colouring. It's also thought that it's a protection against insect damage, <coughs> which could be the reason why trees in Europe don't tend to go red. Um, going back a long time, this is about uh, <coughs> 35 million years ago, there was a spell of ice ages, and very dry periods. And at this time, the, because the mountain ranges in America go from north to south, things could move south as it got chillier in the north. In Europe, everything got stuck at the Alps, couldn't cross the Alps. So the insect pests actually died out and became extinct. Whereas in America, they migrated south to get out of the cold and then they came back when it warmed up. So the trees in America are specially adapted to cope with these insect pests. 
and the red colouring puts them off. Basically, a red leaf doesn't look tasty, whereas a yellow or a golden leaf does. Uh, this is much more like the normal colours we get. These are beech leaves, absolutely gorgeous golden browns, yellows, sunlight behind them, so beautiful. And of course, they're not going to last for very long, so appreciate them while you can. The next thing that happens is they all drop off. And here's it's a, a scientific thing about how they drop off. You don't really need to know how, they just do it. But the thing is, they have this layer of abscission between the leaf and the twig, which means that because it hardens and everything's sealed off, when the leaves drop off, they don't leave a wound of any sort. So it's a nice clean break. A little scar is left on the twig with the bud for next year just behind it. And there they all are, making a wonderful carpet on the ground for you to wander through, kick the leaves, nice frosty day, what could be better? They're also, of course, recycling into the ground um, to provide food for the trees for next year. And a nice comfortable layer on the ground which makes insulation for everything that's living underneath it. So don't kick too hard, there might be something under there. The other wonderful aspect about autumn is the fruits. It really is the season of mists and mellow fruitfulness. There's some beautiful coloured berries, some cotoneasters here, sloes on the right, um, a sort of dogwoody thing down in the bottom left, and some round berries. All there as fantastic fruits, seeds for the birds to eat, and of course to provide the new generation of trees and shrubs. They're specially designed so that the, the, the birds and the animals will eat them and then they'll go off and spread the seeds as they, as they go so the seeds aren't all falling under the parent plant and allowing things to, to move about. The hard tree fruits are also all coming on the song. A lot of these actually do need a bit of frost before they can germinate. So um, putting all the goodness that they've gathered over the summer into their fruits and fruiting now, the seeds will be deposited on the ground and a lot of them need a bit of frost to make them work and of course they won't start growing until the springtime, until it warms up again. But the hard coatings mean that they'll be quite safe and they'll be ready to go as soon as it gets warm. Plenty of places you can see wonderful displays of uh, the berry, berry fruits, the soft fruits and the hard tree fruits um, around the county. Go and have a look in any of our woodland reserves. There'll be acorns, beech. I don't think it's a very good year for beech, but beech mast, uh, horse chestnut. A lot of the hazels are gone now, the squirrels have had them but the sweet chestnuts are still there and it seems to be a year that you can actually pick ones up that are fit to eat. Some years they don't fruit well and you just get little flat ones. Um, they're never going to grow into everything. You've got nice big plump ones, take them home and roast them, but leave plenty for the squirrels as well. And the other thing we get in autumn is a wonderful display of fungi. All sorts of colours. I'm not very good at fungi, so you'll have to excuse me if I don't name them all. Um, these ones are uh, um, one of the seps at the top there, um, nice edible fungus. Uh, chanterelles beneath them, the trumpet-shaped yellow ones that smell lovely, and um, some stag's horn fungus on the right there. Um, great time to go out for a fungus foray. You see all sorts of different things. Some really pretty little ones growing on a tree, I don't know what these ones are. And this is some honey fungus. Uh, this is in the Arboretum in Ellesmere. Uh, the dead trees, of course, covered in it. It's a, a good edible fungus. This was a fungus foray we did a few years ago. And as you can see, it was a lovely basket full of perfectly edible fungus. I would advise if you're going fungus foraying, that if you're not an expert, and don't have one you can take with you, uh, take your camera rather than a basket. There's quite a few of them that will give you quite an unpleasant stomach ache. 
Um, some of them just don't taste very good. Um, some of them can have quite bad effects. And of course, um, this is one of our prize uh, poisonous ones. Fairy tale fungus. It's, a, it's the fly agaric. Absolutely spectacular to look at, but really not a good idea to eat. So take pictures rather than picking the fungus. Good places to see fungi, um, places like brown moss, uh, anywhere with woodlands, all, a lot of our reserves that have easy access woodlands, go and have a look, see what fungus there are. Grassland fungi, quite often in churchyards, it's always worth having a, having a look around there. And of course they're all busy recycling all the dead leaves, the dead tree debris, the dead branches and things, putting the goodness back into the soil so that the trees have something to feed on, um, ready to produce all the leaves next year and the, and the blossoms and then the fruit in its turn. And making use of all this wonderful bounty, all the animals that are getting ready to hibernate or at least to shut down a bit for the winter so that they've got plenty of resources when the food gets short, when the days get short and the weather gets cold, perhaps they're just like us, they don't want to go out in the bad weather, perhaps they just want to stay in their nests, keep cosy, so they want to put plenty of weight on so they're ready for the cold season. Here's a totally familiar face, a red squirrel, um, busy, busy hoarding, um, hoarding nuts. They, they bury them individually. Um, you'll see them on your lawn, perhaps, carrying a nut in their mouth and then scrabbling a little hole, and shoving it in and patting it down. So they, can, they have it nicely hidden and they can remember where they put it, or at least they hope they can. <coughs> Jays are another important one. They also hoard nuts for the winter. Um, fabulous birds. Um, really incredible noise they make. They sound like woodland parrots almost. Um, very good time of year to see them in the woodlands. And they're ex extremely keen on acorns. Um, one of the best distributors of acorns, the last thing an oak tree wants is for its acorn to fall underneath the tree and stay there because there's no light for the young tree to grow. So they rely on things like jays which carry the acorns and they stash them for the winter, burying them under the ground. Uh, where an oak tree wants to grow is sort of through a bramble bush or a gorse bush, because then the young tree is protected against things like deer that would eat the young leaves, eat the young bark. So a, a jay is a really excellent way to get your acorns transported away from the tree and maybe hidden under one of these bramble bushes or gorse bushes. In Austria, they believe there are huge oak woodlands there and they believe that an oak tree can't grow unless the jay has planted it. They call them Eichenhoyer, oak planters. Absolutely wonderful things. They do great work. Um, people used to think that they actually forgot a lot of their acorns and that's why there were some left to grow. But there's evidence now, people have noticed the fact that they, some of the acorns that grow, the jays will come back to in the spring when they have chicks, and they'll nip off the seed leaves, just seed leaves, that's the bit that doesn't look like an oak leaf that first comes out. And those are full of goodness, and they take them and feed them to the baby jays. So it's almost like they've planted an oak tree, they've eaten some of their acorns to keep them going over the winter, but they've left some to grow, they've planted oak trees, so they've got those seed leaves, the cotyledons, that are particularly nutritious for the young jays. So absolutely incredible evolution of the bird with the tree, and um, totally essential really for the spreading of oak trees away from where they're growing. So you get them dispersing over the landscape, they're filling in open patches, they're finding new places to be. 
This is one of our true hibernators. We don't have many in this country. Proper hibernators, we have dormice, all about species, and hedgehogs. These are the ones that actually sleep solidly, only waking up occasionally, not really leaving the nest during the winter at all. And to do this, they need to put on an awful lot of fat. They also develop brown fat, which is different from their normal fat, which helps them when they wake up in the spring. It gives them an instant boost of energy. So these little creatures are stuffing themselves. Obviously, the dormice, they're known for eating nuts and berries and this sort of thing. The bats will be eating as many midges and as many moths and not flying bugs as they can to get plenty of fat to, to hibernate properly. In true hibernation, the um, creatures, I would say they need a lot of fat. They, the a dormouse normally would weigh about 20 grams. Going into hibernation, it'll be up to about 35 um, or even more. You know, they put on their own weight again almost. Um, they'll have a snug nest. Dormice tend to hibernate at ground level rather than up in the trees and in nest boxes and things. Hedgehogs obviously will have found somewhere under a pile of sticks or a pile of leaves. You can help them by making sure your garden's not tidy in the autumn leave the dead leaves, rake them into a heap, the hedgehogs will thank you. Once they've put on all this fat and found their snug home, once the temperature drops below a certain threshold, it's about 16 degrees centigrade for, for hedgehogs, they'll snuggle down into the nest and fall asleep. The breathing and heartbeat and metabolism slow radically during the proper hibernation state. Um, a dormouse's met metabolism is down by about 90%. They're breathing only a very few times a minute. Their blood's going around very slowly. And there's an alteration to the blood plasma that carries all the blood cells and oxygen and everything around in the blood. So that with this very slow circulation, they don't have problems with deep vein thrombosis or clotting or anything like that. So it's a special adaptation particularly for hibernating. And there's one nice and fast asleep. Hedgehogs, obviously, very similar thing. They've rolled into a ball. They've got all that brown fat, keeping them cosy for the winter. They will wake up periodically, maybe have a drink, but they don't eat and they don't really excrete any waste products. They, they, they're not producing them in the winter. Autumn, though, is the time for fattening up. So if you see hedgehogs in your garden, you can always put out a little hedgehog food. You can get dry hedgehog food or some meaty cat food, not the fishy sort, but the little trays of meaty cat food. And they'll enjoy it and it'll help them bulk up a bit. If you see ones that are particularly small, under about a pound in weight, that sort of thing, um, really you need to get in touch with somebody like Q1 Wildlife Rescue or the RSPCA in case they're too small to hibernate. <coughs> Hedgehogs going into hibernation at very low body weight are in danger of not surviving. So it's, uh, it's possible for these to be kept over winter in a warm place and they'll survive very nicely. Um, I had one fostered one winter underweight to hibernate. So it's actually lived under the desk in my study. Um, it was a bad tempered little thing and it smelt quite a lot and dug several holes in the carpet. And then come the spring, he went out in the garden and um, ran away remarkably quickly for something with such short legs. And I never saw him again. He never even said thank you. But there we go, at least he survived. Some of the insects also will be preparing to overwinter. Um, Red Admiral butterflies are increasingly hibernating in this country rather than migrating. They used to be a migratory species and now we have them. You'll find them maybe in your garden shed, your log store, somewhere like that, hung up upside down, link, we, li, pff, wings tightly closed and sleeping out the winter. 
other hibernators are the small tortoise shells. You quite often find them in your curtains, your window embrasures, um, or down, particularly if you have sash windows, they like to go down the sash boxes and they will wake up in your house if it's particularly sunny and the windows become warm. Um, if you find a butterfly that's awake in your house in the winter, a good thing to do is to put down a little saucer of sugar water. Just dissolve a little sugar in a teaspoon of water just to give it an energy boost. And then it'll go back to sleep somewhere dark and cool again. Comma butterflies, brimstones also will hibernate. And like I say, look in your sheds, there might be one up there, under bits of bark, um, these sort of places. But they, again, need to get a good boost before they go into hibernation. So at this time of year, the ivy flowers are coming out and they have these wonderful sort of green balls of flower with the, the yellow um, anthers sticking out and lots and lots of pollen in them. If you walk past one, you'll hear the bees and hoverflies all buzzing around them and see them covered in butterflies. When I took this photograph in my garden, I think there were 14 red admirals on one clump of ivy, one well, big clump of ivy, but you know, and bees on it as well. And it was absolutely humming. So ivy is a very, very useful thing to have at this time of year. It's flowering when there isn't very much out and it's producing loads of nectar and a good boost for these little animals to keep them through the winter. They have another trick up their sleeves though. Because they don't need energy during the winter, they can convert the sugars in their body into a, a form of antifreeze. Um, they, they, they make, make glycerol out of, out of the sugars, which will stop them getting frozen up in the winter. So it's a bit, it's, it, it stops them freezing and, and being killed, even if they're not somewhere that looks particularly well protected. Obviously they don't make nests of leaves or anything. You know, they're just hanging there. So it stops them chilling. And what else is happening in the animal world? Well, for those of them that aren't going to hibernate or migrate or anything like that, they're going to stay active through the winter. Some species will be changing their coats. Um, all the animals are getting thicker coats. A lot of them change colour a bit. The deer change colour a bit. Most obviously, the stoats. These are, uh, these are both stoats. The one on the left is a summer stoat, and the one on the right is a winter stoat or an ermine. You won't see them this white in Shropshire. Uh, in Scotland, places with high snowfall, they do go white. Obviously, it, it's good camouflage, apart from the fact they keep a black tip on their tail. And that's why when you see the lords on the television in their ermines, they've all got those little black flecks, and that's the tail tips, which stay black. But the rest of them, dead white. Sometimes down here we'll get them partially turning into ermine, so you get a rather patchy looking stoat, but generally speaking, we don't have enough snow to warrant it and it's really too warm to trigger that mechanism. But watch out for things looking a little bit different um, as, as they grow the fur for winter to keep them snug. Other species that are moving about, um, this, is, um, this is a tawny owl. A lot of the owls will be dispersing. The young ones that have been together for the summer are moving off to find their own territories. Their parents will drive them out. So time to get off on your own. They don't want the teenagers sitting around cluttering the place up. Too much competition for food in the cold weather and uh, when hunting is hard. So it's a great time of year to hear them. You'll hear hooting owls declaring their territory. Particularly the tawny owls, very easy to, to distinguish. There's the males doing the hoo hoo sound and the females going ee and they're, they're communicating with each other. 
uh, the young ones will know what is a taken territory and what might be available for them to move into, um, not only to support them for the winter, but also when they come into breeding um, condition next year, they'll have their own patch. This time of year is also important um, as the start of the breeding season. Uh, some of our larger mammals, largest mammals, the deer, are all going into what's known as the rut. This is the mating season for deer. And this is a fallow deer. And they, you can see them quite easily at Attingham Park. They've got quite a large herd of them. And they're going, they're going into the rut. So you will see them scrapping with each other, rattling their antlers and, and bellowing. Now, red deer also will be going into the rut and they too will be bellowing furiously. Uh, Powys Castle is probably the, the nearest place you can see them, just outside the county, another natural, National Trust property and they have a large herd of red deer and you can hear them roaring, um, they fight and they do all the usual things. Now, they're not doing it quite the same as the fallow deer. They both roar, they both make very sort of butch sounding noises to each other. The fallow deer adopt a traditional rutting stand, if you like, a place where the deer, the, the female deer, the other deer, know is, is somewhere that's, that's a good place to display yourself. They've got their fine antlers that they've grown through the summer. Uh, they're showing off, they're, they're roaring, um, they're scraping mud hollows in the ground, they're thrashing the vegetation with their antlers and um, displaying at the, the rutting stand. Um, they tend to pee in the mud scrapes, they, they, they um, have little tufts of fur that they pee onto and they can sort of wave around a bit and to attract the females. Uh, I was reading um, David McDonald's European Mammals the other day and he puts it very nicely. He says they, they thrash the vegetation with their antlers and generally behave in an attractive way. I'm not sure if peeing in a muddy hole is really attractive, but for deer, maybe it is. Uh, they're then visited by does who size up the available males and, as David McDonald puts it, bestow their favours as they choose. Now, the red deer do a similar sort of thing. They do the roaring and the muddy wallows and the peeing in the ground and the thrashing and all that sort of thing. But they're, what they're doing is amassing a harem. So they've got maybe eight or 12, possibly a lot more hinds, the female red deers, and the red deer stags are there guarding their harem. So they, if the hinds move off to feed, the red the stag goes with them and he tries to stop any other stag going anywhere near them. So completely different method really. He's, um, he's more or less, um, he's chosen his hinds, he's forcing himself upon them, if you like, whereas with the fallow deers, the hinds are doing the, cho the, the does, the females in fallow deer are the doe, and they're doing the choosing. So there we have two fine fighting stags. Usually the more mature they are, the heavier they are, and the better condition they are, the more fights they'll win, and the larger har harem they can hold on to. It's also the breeding season for salmon. Um, they'll have spent uh, most of their lives away at sea. Um, these are a wonderful thing to see. When they come back up the river, they have to come into fresh water to breed. So they come back out of the ocean, they come back up the river they, they were born in, 
and they go up to the higher parts of the river where the water is shallower with a gravelly substrate that's suitable for making their nests or reds as they're called with salmon so they can lay their eggs. Of course with the way we've changed rivers there's quite a lot of um, there's quite a lot of obstruction to the run of the salmon so they're having to get across weirs and these sort of things so you can see them leaping out of the water this one was at uh, uh, Shrewsbury Weir it's a great place to see them the run's just started so when there's if, particularly if the, there's quite a lot of water in the river they'll leap the weir rather than going the fish passes and um, it's an absolutely spectacular sight they don't only do it at weirs though I've seen leaping salmon just sitting on the side of the riverbank towards dusk time and one leapt out of the water in front of us full breeding condition he's got all the red on his belly he's got his coat and breeches on and he's away up the river and he looked honestly as if he was jumping just for the fun of it um, apparently they do it also to rid themselves of sea lice ones that are just newly come to the river will have these parasites that they can will die off in the fresh water but the salmon will leap to dislodge them one of the spectacles of autumn wildlife though really worth going and having a look right in the middle of Shrewsbury uh, talking of autumn spectaculars this is a starling murmuration um, there are various ideas of why they do this well, basically they're gathering in very large flocks just before they go to roost so the time to watch out for these is in the evening um, autumn evenings winter evenings you can see these enormous flocks of starlings gathering together and moving around swirling in the sky so the pattern changes all the time it's a bit like one of those things you used to have with the um, with the iron filings in and you could run your magnet round underneath it and change the patterns it looks just like that and they're all talking to each other and none of them fly into each other and it's thought that each bird that they look as if they're synchronized like sort of synchronized starlings all doing it on purpose but each bird is aware of the seven or eight birds around it rather than the whole flock so they're all reacting to the birds immediately surrounding them and they do this wonderful swirling dance it's other flocks will come and join them so it starts out quite small and builds up and builds up until you've got this absolute mob of starlings in the sky it's very good for confusing predators basically the starlings are massing together so that they all roost in the same place safety in numbers and while they're amassing they all keep moving so that a um, say a peregrine falcon comes across or something like that it can't choose an individual victim they have to lock on to a single individual to chase rather than just sort of plowing through the middle like whales and things do so they're confusing anybody that wants to kill them they're also advertising we're a flock we want more of you to come and join us we've got a lovely reed bed here we're going to over overwinter in over overnight in rather and then um, it'll be used sort of through the cold months by this huge mob of starlings there was a really good one last year at Wixon Moss um, you could you could you could watch them swirling around and this one was a few years ago um, just by lineal by the you could watch them off the canal and I was taking pictures and this one popped up and it seems the murmuration has actually configured itself into the shape of a giant starling which I thought was very clever of them sort of postmodern art for birds another thing to watch out for in the autumn is the incoming migrant geese um, they tend quite often fly at night and you'll hear them honking and flying in the v-shaped formation which uh, conserves energy as they fly and they come down from places like uh, Iceland, Svalbard, um, the north of Scandinavia 
um, and Russia, and they're coming in to take advantage of our milder climate. Um, a lot of them are grass eaters, of course, the, the, the geese. They'll be grazing on, um, on grassy fields and uh, staying overnight on open water so they're safe. So you can see them coming in and making large flocks for the winter. Places like Ellesmere, uh, Venus Pool, um, any stretch of open water will be holding uh, winter migrants from from the north um, and you can hear them make it, the sound when they're settled is, is different but the sound when they're flying is quite amazing um, there's something sort of slightly otherworldly about it especially in the dark there's some <coughs> some smaller garden birds that are also winter visitors You'll notice, of course, at this time of year, all our swallows and martins, um, chiff chaffs and things like this have gone south, off to warmer climes. But these ones are coming from Scandinavia, so they think it's warmer here. Um, the winter thrushes, as they call them, the Scandinavian thrushes, are the missile thrushes at the top left here. Below that are red wing. You see these in large flocks, um, quite often hear them rather than see them absolutely robbing out all the fruits in the hedges. Um, they love hawthorn berries, um, thing, thing, things like this, and they'll descend on first the hawthorns and then the sloes and this sort of thing, as, as moving through the season with what they fancy. And later in the winter, you'll see them on the windfall apples in your garden. Always nice to leave some. You get big flocks of these winter thrushes. You also get a lot of immigrant um, if you like, blackbirds um, that have come down from the north as well to join our native ones. So a lot more blackbirds than you usually have and these winter thrushes all looking for something to eat. This time of year I always keep a few boxes of the windfall apples in the garage so that when it gets really frosty or snowy I've got some there to throw out for the winter, winter thrushes. Top right is a bramling, looks often flocking with the chaffinches and bottom right siskins they're another winter visitor that you might see on your bird feeders always quite exciting to see a new bird uh, the bramling is particularly very smart little birds but when they're moving around with the chaffinches you'd think of the same thing so do take care to have a really good look at your chaffinches because in amongst them will be one that looks just a bit too orange and it's a bramling in its winter plumage a bit more spectacular for the summer but of course we don't get them here, they're breeding further north. And if we're really, really lucky, we might get waxwings. Uh, I love them. They're, they're, they're about starling shape, they're quite a chunky thing, but they've got this rather sort of punky hairdo, and they look like something out maybe out of a Japanese illustration. Lovely colours, lovely lines, quite often seen in supermarket car parks. Uh, they don't care whether it's a native fruit or a sort of garden variety. They love the pink ketonia, the, the, the pink rowans and the white rowans that our native birds don't really notice. Um, and they'll absolutely strip the trees. They'll descend in a flock and absolutely strip the tree. And you get a report um, the, in the Morrison's car park in Whitchurch or something, and you, you, you sort of have to go and see them because they are just so spectacular. Those lovely red and yellow patches on their wings that really look like they're little bits of sealing wax. Spectacular things. Don't always get them. It depends how hard the weather is in the north, of course. But keep an eye out. They'll be starting to come in fairly soon. If you're excited by all this and feel that your garden is a little lacking in autumn, and you could do a bit more autumn in your garden, um, you can have a think about planting something that will um, bring some autumn colour to you. This is a, a, a Japanese maple, they have fantastic colours, huge range of fantastic colours as well, and they tend to be quite easily managed, fairly compact trees, so very good for a garden setting. As you can see here, I've got the, I've got the bird feeders in this one, so I've got the lovely colours and I've got my autumn migrants coming in to feed on the bird feeders. Birches have that lovely yellow colour, so you can, you can 
go for a bit of gold as well as your, your red. Birches, again, you can get small varieties, easy for the garden. And also appreciate the lovely fall of leaves underneath the trees. Berries, you can, um, you can grow. This is a weeping cotoneaster. As you can see in this picture, it's absolutely covered in berries at this time of year. Um, it'll stay covered in berries until everything gets just so cold or I don't know, maybe the, the wild fruit is just diminished or whatever. And then a couple of blackbirds will descend on it or even better, a missile thrush. They will defend it against all comers and they'll strip the lot in one day. And they do this with the holly trees as well. You can quite often see a missile thrush guarding its fruit bush. So plenty of things you can do to bring autumn wildlife into your garden and give it a boost when it needs to fatten up a bit. There's a last picture of the Red Admiral again, fattening up on the nectar of the ivy. Absolutely fabulous thing to see. And on those lovely clear autumn days, what could be better? As usual, thank you very much for joining us. If you're not already a member, do consider joining us. We can do absolutely nothing without our members. It can cost you as little as £3 a month for adults only, or £5 a month if you've got a family. Lots of lovely things online, super things for your kids to do. The whole new e-newsletter for families um, coming out for the half term. Um, consider it and get, get out and do it, basically. You can do it all online, follow the link um, on, on our website, the Join Us link, and sign up and come and feel like you're really doing something for Shropshire's Wildlife. Thank you very much. <laughs>